Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is due Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about His healing, of His cleansing power revealing, how He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He cleansed me ere I knew Him, and all my love is due Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion He has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to Him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme, let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, He will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee, He is able to deliver thee, He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to Him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Isn't He wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And 
And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. I believe that this life will its great mysteries surely someday will come to an end but faith will conquer the darkness and death and will has the power to change lives today. to Ephesians chapter number 2, Ephesians chapter number 2, what a blessing it is to see each and every one of you, I hope and pray that you all had a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving, just right around the corner within what, three weeks, it'll be Christmas time already, man, this year has flown by, seems like it's just getting faster and faster and faster every day that I wake up, and so... Ephesians chapter number 2 this morning, we're going to pick up reading there in verse number 1, and we'll read down through verse number 7, and I'll, I'll bring you the message from this passage this morning. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh... In the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, verse number 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning, God, we thank you for your presence, we thank you for each person that's here. We thank you, God, that, uh, Lord, for the, the work that you have done 
for us on Mount Calvary. Lord, we just ask that you would meet with us this morning. God, that the words that come out of my mouth are only those words that you would have me to say. And Lord, I ask that each person that's here today, Lord, that they would have their hearts open to you. Lord, that they would be attentive uh, to your word and to the moving of your Holy Spirit in their lives. And God, again, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, I ask that today, even this morning, would be their day of salvation. Help us as Christians to examine our hearts and get right with you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. So this morning, I w- I'd like to speak with you about, uh, about uh, three truths concerning every person without Christ. Three truths concerning every person without Christ. Our passage this morning is a very important passage uh, uh, that's in the Bible. And it is very important for every single person in the entire world. It gives us some very important information that we need to understand and apply uh, to our lives. It tells us who we are on our own. It tells us who we are on our own. It tells us, uh, it tells us the fact of, about every single one of us. It tells us who we are. It tells us that Christ has changed our heart, has changed our lives, if you accept him as your Lord and Savior. So this morning, very quickly, three truths concerning every person without Christ. And can I tell you, every single person that's ever been born in this world was born without Christ. All right? So number one this morning, truth concerning every person without Christ is number one is he is dead. Spiritually, he is dead spiritually there there in verse number one, it says, and you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The person without Christ is uh, is physically alive. Hey, we are alive physically, but spiritually. We're dead. There are three kinds of death in this world. There's physical death. That is the separation of of your spirit. And your body, and there is spiritual death. That is separation of your uh, of your spirit from God. And then there is eternal death, and that is e- eternal separation uh, from the presence of God in the real place called hell. Spiritual death is the past condition of those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But can I tell you this morning that it is the present condition of everyone else in the world. If you know Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, hey, praise the Lord, you are no longer spiritually dead. You have been made alive, and that's exactly what that word quickened uh, uh, means there in uh, verse number one, where it says, and you hath he quickened who are dead. Hey, he has made you alive, but everyone else in the world who is without Christ, is still spiritually dead. The person without uh, without Christ is spiritually dead, not because he sins, but because he's a sinner. But because he's a sinner, in Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 12, uh, the Bible says this, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, For that all have sinned. Every single person in the entire world has sinned against God. Uh, Romans chapter 3 verse number 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verse number 10 and and, uh, through verse number 12. Let's go ahead and turn there. I know I'm flying through it. Let's go ahead and turn there. Romans chapter 3 verse number 10 through verse number 12. The Bible says, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all, uh, they're all gone out of the way. They are all are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. I, hey, I know that there's a lot of people in the world that would say, hey, I'm a good person. 
I don't. I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't. I haven't stole uh, from very many people. I haven't. Uh, 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 I go to church. I, in fact, I'm at church all the time whenever the doors are open. And, and and listen, I am a good person. But can I tell you? The Bible says that absolutely every single person is a sinner. That means that we have been separated from God. There is that we are we are sinners separated from God. In fact, God gave Adam a warning. Adam was the very first man that had ever lived in this world. And God gave Adam a warning. He said, listen, you can eat of any tree, of any bush, of any plant in the entire garden of Eden. But from one tree, you're to stay away. And he says there in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 17, he says, But of the tree, this is God speaking to uh, to Adam, he says, "Uh, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. This is the warning. He says, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Hey, he, He ate from that tree. God told him not to eat of it, and he ate from it. And lo and behold, he was still alive. He was still kicking on this earth. Both he and and Eve were still were still physically alive, but the moment they took of it, immediately they were separated from God. Spiritual death happened. And from that point on, throughout the rest of eternity, throughout the rest of the world today. You and I are separated from God. We are spiritually dead. Why? Because we are all our ancestors go all the way back to Adam and Eve. And the Bible t- tells us that every single person is a sinner. David says it this way. He declares there in Psalms chapter uh, 51 and verse number 5. He says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, what uh, what David was saying is that, that, listen, I was a sinner at birth. A sinner from the very moment that my mom and dad conceived me. Those little bitty babies that come out whenever, whenever they're born in the world, they're so cute, aren't they? They're so precious. Whether they have hair or not, they're they're just beautiful. But can I tell you, they're still sinners. Why? Because we have, we're born with a sin nature. And we got that sin nature from Adam. Hey, we we are sinners that are dead spiritually. We have been separated from God. We're not born neutral with the possibility of, uh, of going this way or, or going that way. Hey, we are born, we are born sinners. Every person without Christ is dead. Someone said, you can't live a life for God until you receive the life of God. And that's true. Again, I tell you, just like I, I said last week or a couple of weeks ago, Jesus Christ is the only one that can give eternal life. That's the life that we have to have. That's the life that we need in order to be spiritually alive again. But can I tell you, for every single person in this world without Christ, they're spiritually dead. Maybe you are here this morning and you have never accepted Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior. You have never accepted what Jesus Christ did on that cross for you when he came to this earth and he died on that cross and he was buried and he rose again to pay for your sin debts. Maybe you've never accepted that. Can I tell you this morning, you're spiritually dead. You walked into this church spiritually dead, but you don't have to walk out of it spiritually dead. You can walk out of it Alive and well spiritually, but the choice is yours. The choice is yours this morning. Hey, can I tell you, number one, for all those people that are without Christ in this world, they're spiritually dead. Secondly, those that are without Christ, he's dominated. 
He is dominated. Look there with me back in our text this, uh, this morning in verse number 2 and the beginning part of verse number 3. The Bible says, Wherein in times past you walk according to the course of, the, of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now uh, worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also, the Bible says, we all had our conversation in times past, fulfilling the lust of our flesh. And can I tell you this morning that, uh, that, uh, that we as, as human beings, we are dominated by our enemies. The Bible teaches us that we have three enemies while we're living uh, here in this world. The first two are are outside forces, and the third one is uh, inside force. The first, the first one, uh, one of our enemies is the world. It's the world. The Bible presents uh, uh, the world as the enemy of God, but not only the enemy of God, but the enemy of Christians as well. In 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 15, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. The Bible says this. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why, would, why do you think God would say, love not the world if it wasn't your enemy? Hey, let me tell you this morning, uh, the world is your enemy. In fact, there in Romans chapter 12, verse number 2, the Bible tells us, and be not conformed to this world. But it says to be transformed. And then the Bible commands us not to be friends with this world. In James chapter 4 and verse number 4, where the Bible says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Why? Because the world is the enemy of God and of man. But is this, is this talking about the world that God created? Is this talking about, uh, about the creation of God? I, I'll have to tell you this morning, it is not talking about the world as in the creation of God. In fact, the Bible tells us there in Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 31, after God had got done creating uh, the world and everything in it, he said this, he said, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Hey, this is, uh, the, the world as, as in the creation of God was very good. This is not, the, that's not the world that, uh, that God is talking about when he says, love not the world. Then, what does God mean by love not the world? It means the world system. The organized system headed by Satan. Uh, which leave God's out, God out, uh, and is actually in opposition to God. It refers to the humanistic system uh, that's at odds with God. It's referring to the world's corrupt value system. And listen, we have we have uh, just in this in the last couple two or three years, we have seen several things uh, uh, this world and even our government going away from what the word of God says the values of the word of God and going with the values of the devil in first John chapter number two verse number 16 uh, details exactly what Satan's system promotes first John chapter 2 verse number 16. The Bible says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Hey, can I tell you this morning that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is what the devil promotes. And can I tell you this morning that every sin imaginable comes out of those three things. You think about it, whenever, God, whenever Jesus Christ was here on this earth and he was tempted by the devil, he was tempted with these three 
things. You and I are tempted every single day with these three things. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And not only, not only is it that, uh, that we are not to love the world because the world is our enemy. Listen, we are... The, the normal person, the natural person without Christ, uh, they, uh, listen, they have an enemy and it's the world. But not only is the world their enemy, but so is the devil. The devil is the enemy of yours and of mine and of God. The Bible describes the devil as uh, the God of this world. Look with me, if you would, please, to... 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4. I know that we serve the one true living God. And that's who we worship. That's who we are talking about today is the one true living God. But can I tell you, the world is our enemy. Why? Because the devil is the God of this world. Here in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4, the Bible says, In whom the God, the little g God of this world, that is the devil, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Hey, can I tell you, the devil is the enemy. The devil is uh, the God of this world. The Bible also describes him as the prince of this world. The prince of this world. Look with me, if you would, please, to John chapter number 12. John chapter number 12. John chapter number 12, verse number 31. John chapter 12, verse number 31, the Bible says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. The prince of this world, what the Bible there is talking about, the devil himself. Hey, he is called the prince of this world. Now look with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 6. goes right along with that. Ephesians chapter number 6. In verse number 12, Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Hey, can I tell you this morning that the devil is described as the God of this world, and he's also described as the prince of this world. And can I tell you, he is the enemy of every single person in the entire world. Whether you're saved or not, whether you know Christ is your personal Lord and Savior or not, the devil is your enemy. He hates your guts. He wants to see you destroyed, defeated, downtrodden. He loves it whenever you're depressed he loves it whenever you're going through hard times in your life because that's what he wants for you he hates your guts he's your enemy but not only is the world our enemy not only is the devil our enemy but the flesh is our enemy hey listen can i tell you this morning listen the person without Christ in their life, they're dominated by their enemies. Dominated by this world. Dominated by the devil. And dominated by the flesh. Look with me, if you would, please, to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. The Bible tells us here in Galatians chapter number 5, beginning there in verse number 16 and verse number 17. The Bible says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary 
the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Hey, can I tell you this morning that, that, you, that, that the flesh is your enemy. Now I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about your physical flesh. But I'm talking about your mind. That is, your, that is your, your natural sin nature. That is your enemy. Those things that. Listen. Every single one of us have those desires every once in a while. There's some thoughts that come through our mind. And we say. Where in the world did you come from? Right? Those things that, that would take us farther away from God rather than drawing us closer to God. Those, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the flesh. Hey, can I tell you, the, the Bible teaches us that, 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 the, that the flesh, the lust of the flesh is your enemy. In our text here in verse number 3, uh, in Ephesians chapter number 2, the Bible says this. In times past, in the, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Hey, can I tell you, uh, here in, in this verse, it says that we, are ful- we all fulfill the lust of the flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. But what in the world is that? If you want to know what that is, look just a couple of verses down there in Galatians chapter number 5 to verses 19 through 21. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21. The Bible says this. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, uh, reveling, and such the like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of of God. Hey, can I tell you this morning, if you are dominated by the flesh, you will not, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you are fulfilling the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, and the pride of life in your life, you are being dominated by your enemies. You're being dominated by this world, by the devil, and by the flesh. But can I tell you this morning? You don't have to stay that way. You don't have to stay that way. If we're not controlled by the Spirit, and that is the Spirit of God in us, the lusts of the flesh will control us. The only way not to be controlled by the lust of the flesh is to submit to the control of the Spirit. And that's the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside. If you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Hey, can I tell you, you don't have to be dominated by your enemies. You can be victorious over them. But the, the person without Christ is dead spiritually. Dominated by his enemies. And number three, he's under the wrath of God. Is under the wrath of God. Ephesians chapter number 2. There at the end of verse 3. It says. uh, Fulfilling the desires of the flesh. And of the mind. And it says. And were by nature. The children of wrath. And were by nature. The children of wrath. Can I tell you. Let me ask you this. How many of you like to think of God. As a God of love. We all do, right? We all, it's easy for us to think of God as being the God of love. We want to think that because He is the God of love. Listen, He loves you and I more than than you and I can ever comprehend in this world. He is the God of love. But can I tell you this morning, it's a we need to understand that He's also the God of wrath. Though he is the God of love, for a lot of people, that's all they want to think about, is he is a God of love. 
They don't want to think about him being a God of wrath. But the Bible tells us there in Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. The Bible says, for the wrath of who? Of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Hey, can I tell you again, the Bible tells us that every single person that has ever lived and that is, that is on the face of the earth today, we are all sinners. That is ungodliness that is unrighteousness in us and the bible says here for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men hey that includes you and that includes me without christ john chapter number three verse number 36 john chapter number three and verse number 36 The Bible says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But what does it say? But the what of God? The wrath of God abideth on him. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Listen, God is the God of love, but hey, we better understand that he's also God of wrath. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1 and verse number 10. The Bible says, And to wait for the Son, for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Hey, you need to understand this morning that every single person in this world that is without Jesus Christ is under the wrath of God. God is God of love, but we must all realize that He's also the God of wrath as well. And His wrath will be poured out one day. It will be poured out one day on every single person without Christ. If our passage there in Ephesians chapter number 2 stopped there, I can tell you this morning we wouldn't have any hope. We would all be spiritually dead. We would all be dominated by our enemies. We would all be under the wrath of God. But praise God, our passage doesn't end there. Praise God, our passage doesn't end with verse number 3. But it goes on to verse number 4 through verse number 7. The Bible says, but God. Hey, can I tell you, those, those two words right there changes everything. It changes absolutely everything about every single person that's without Christ. Hey, listen, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you'll accept Christ, you will have Christ with you. And it changes everything. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Hey again it says, but God who is rich in mercy for his grace great love hey can i tell you god is a god of love that's why he's given us the opportunity to uh, to not be dominated by our by our our enemies that's why he's given us an opportunity to be alive again spiritually that's why he's given us the opportunity so that we're not under his wrath anymore but it's only in jesus christ but god who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Hey, can I tell you, God is love. And because he is, uh, because God is love, he gives us the opportunity to become alive spiritually from the dead. He dominates those enemies 
that dominated us. Hey, what a, what a wonderful thing to think about. Hey, the, the God, the creator of this world who wants to have a relationship with me. Who, hey, and can I tell you this morning, who has a relationship with me. Hey, listen, I am no longer dominated by those things. But, but my Lord and Savior, he dominates my enemies. And he dominates your enemies as well. And he saved us from his wrath. He saved us from his wrath that's to come upon every person. Without Christ. Hey, because God is love, He sent Jesus to forgive us of our sins and save us from condemnation. And the Bible tells us that every single person without Christ is already condemned. You're already condemned from the time uh, you're conceived. You're already condemned. Why? Because you're a sinner. But the Bible says if you're in Christ, if you have Christ, you're no longer condemned. Look with me, if you would, please, to uh, John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3, verse number 17 and verse number 18. The Bible says this, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hey, because God is the God of love. He's given us the opportunity to live forever in his presence. But can I tell you this morning, the choice is yours. The choice is mine. Every person without Christ is dead spiritually. He's dominated by uh, the world, the devil, and the flesh. And he's under the wrath of God. But they don't have to stay that way. They can choose to be saved from all of these things. They can choose to accept the free salvation that God is offering everyone. Let me ask you this morning, what is your choice? Maybe you're here this morning, you've already made that choice. You know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. Uh, You've accepted Him and and, and you're no longer longer dead spiritually. You're no longer dominated uh, by your enemies. You're no longer under the wrath of God. And we praise God for that, do we not? But let me ask you this this morning, Christian. What about you? When was the last time that you gave the opportunity to someone else to become alive spiritually? To have their enemies dominated by Jesus Christ. Be out from under the wrath of God. When was the last time that you gave someone else that opportunity? Oh, Pastor, well, I don't, under, I don't know how to, uh, to give the gospel. I don't know how to. Hey, when was the last time you even, even invited someone to the church? We have, these, we have these things called tracks. And we have new ones now. And they even have a little candy cane on them. Hey, pass them out. It has a gospel message on there. It gives the other person the opportunity. To know Christ as their Lord and Savior. We have all kinds of tracks out there. When, when was the last time you just invited someone to church? Hey, won't you come to church with me today? If you need a ride, I'll come by and pick you up. You can even sit with me. Christian, what about you? Hey, someone gave you that opportunity. What about you giving that opportunity to someone else? Hey, every single person in this world that's without Christ is dead spiritually, dominated by their enemies, and under the wrath of God. This morning, you've got an opportunity to change all of that in your life. Or you have the opportunity to give someone else that opportunity in their life. 
what decision will you make this morning? If you would, please stand. I'll stay in the old time way. The way that believes in Jesus. For he makes lost sinners brand new. The way that believes the Bible and proclaims every word. See